Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. I hope you're having a great day. You can go ahead and open in your Bibles to Galatians chapter one. This morning we'll be in Galatians chapters one and two. This morning there's some uh, fresh news that may have hit your news feed, and uh, those of you who may not have been online yet may not have heard that uh, America's pastor, Billy Graham, passed away at 99 years old. I think it's fitting to just uh, pause and consider that we are pygmies who stand on the shoulders of giants, and the things that we see clearly are the result of those who have gone before us, and surely this is a moment in history that uh, while just a man, a godly man, has lived a life of faithfulness and gone home to be with the Lord. Billy Graham once said, my one purpose in life is to help people find a personal relationship with God, which I believe comes through knowing Christ. Well now, 1 John 3, 2 tells us, beloved, we are God's children and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. And today, Billy Graham now sees Jesus as he is and truly knows him in fullness. Billy Graham said, someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. So praise God for a life of faithfulness. May we all strive for that. And it's actually fitting for our our text this morning in, in Galatians chapters one and two to look at a story in Paul's life and how that resulted in crucified courage for the long haul. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace to us. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to see your word by the gift of your spirit. We pray that you would help us to persevere in faith, Lord, as we see this example who has gone before us. We pray that you would help us to live lives of faithfulness for all the years of the life that we have on this earth. May we serve you, that others may know Christ, that we might one day behold him in glory. And Father, we pray that uh, this morning you would grant us lives of crucified courage to live in faithfulness to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Some of you are are looking uh, better this morning than you usually do, and uh, I appreciate that because there's a career fair going on over in the field house starting after chapel, and so uh, make sure you get on over there. If uh, you have not yet signed up for that or you don't have plans to go over there, let's change course right away and after chapel, go put on your best threads and head over there. Freshmen, sophomores, juniors, senior, graduate students, whoever you are, go over and uh, go network with employers, gain experience in doing that and you never know what the Lord will do. It's a very important part of how the Lord can lead you to where he wants you in this world. Well, we like stories of extraordinary people who demonstrate extraordinary courage. Right? We love ordinary people who, in certain moments, rise to the occasion. I think of uh, the uh, airplane pilot uh, 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 of the plane that landed in the East River in New York City, Captain Sullenberger, and the movie that was made about him to celebrate his life. We think about Uh, People like Major Richard Winters, who's memorialized in the series Band of Brothers, who was just a guy from eastern Pennsylvania who joined the army and joined the 101st Airborne Division and ultimately rose through the ranks because of his humble service and demonstrated amazing courage in the field of battle. We remember people like those on United Airlines Flight 93 in the 9-11 attacks who banded together to prevent more damage, more destruction by acting in a moment of courage that ultimately was their own self-sacrifice for the benefit of other people. There's an early Christian martyr you may not have heard of by the name of Perpetua who uh, was the daughter of a well-to-do Roman official and uh, came to Christ and was arrested by a Roman imp- the Roman Empire and was then ultimately martyred before the beasts in the Colosseum because of her commitment to Christ, when there was an appeal that all she had to do was to forsake Christ and swear allegiance to the Caesar. These stories, they rise to the surface in our society because there's something about ordinary people who demonstrate extraordinary courage. And what I want to do this morning is go to Galatians chapters one and two and grab a picture of the Apostle Paul 
in his ministry of how he was addressing a particular need at a particular time and was an ordinary man who then came to demonstrate extraordinary courage. And sometimes we think about courage as a personality trait. We think about these people who may have just great boldness. They might just have a wiring in their brain that allows them to not care about the opinions of other people or that they just don't feel the risk in certain situations. What I wanna argue for you today is that what we see here is that courage is not a result of personality and it's not just for certain people to demonstrate and these heroes out there, but it's actually something that all of us pursue as Christians. It's an incredible need in our day and time and courage is a result of the crucified life. All right, so Paul shares this story of the first few decades of his ministry. And across this story, what we're gonna see, the main point is that the crucified life produces courage for truth and life. The crucified life produces courage. And so read with me in Galatians chapter one, beginning in verse six. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I striving to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. We come to this moment in the middle of a story of Paul's interaction with the Galatians. And this story begins with Paul's ministry in this region we call Galatia, which is on the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea, that he went and he ministered amongst these people and planted churches amongst Gentiles, those who are not Jews and who would not have been involved in keeping the law, represented by circumcision, the dietary laws, and so forth. And so somewhere along the way, as he goes and preaches the liberty that comes from the gospel, where we have release from the power of sin in our lives, that comes only through, by grace through faith, that then somebody has come into these churches and been teaching something contrary to what Paul was teaching. We'll come to see in a moment that what they're teaching is that they have to keep the dietary laws and that circumcision may be required and that yes, Christ's sacrifice was important. He's the Messiah, but there's an adding to that of a requirement for works. And so as he comes to this uh, issue with them, he's deeply disturbed. He is troubled in his heart and he uh, even views this as a way that they're being brought back into bondage. And so his correction to them is not coming by way of searing rebuke, but it's coming as somebody who is appealing with a broken heart because you're choosing bondage and slavery when you don't have to, Galatians. And so in the story, Martin Luther comments on these couple of chapters of Galatians and likens it to a building that's being built. And this building was started by the master craftsman Christ. And then the Galatians have been deceived into thinking that they will finish the building by their own works. In light of this compromise, Paul is astonished. We see in verse six, he says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to another gospel. In response to this deception, Paul doesn't just launch right in with an abstract theological explanation. He tells them a story. He draws them into his own life to show how this has played out. And this morning, we'll look at this story for through, through four themes that reveal how the crucified life produces courage. So the first of these themes is that the source of the gospel is from God and not from humanity. Is the gospel from God or from man? To answer this question determines our entire relationship to the world around us. Paul's approach to the Galatians was determined by the fact that he viewed himself as having a gospel that was revealed from God and therefore stands authoritative over all of life. It's not a mere invention of humanity. It's not the simple religious reflections of a group that then is brought together in a book and amounts to the pursuit of God from humanity below to above. 
But you see, this gospel is revealed from God above. From the very first words of the book, Paul is making this clear. In a way that he doesn't always open his other letters, he opens the Galatians here in Galatians 1.1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. You see, right from the very words, he's giving an apologetic, he's making an appeal, he's demonstrating to them to say, listen, as I'm writing to you, right, I'm writing to you as an apostle, not in one who has inherited something that is just merely human, passed down from hands to hands to hands in human terms, but ultimately I'm writing to you one who stands under the authority of a divine message, and that message that I relay to you is not found in the humans who passed it along, but in the God that it comes from. He continues with this sort of theme. We get down to this passage we've read already in Galatians 1, verses six through nine. He says, I'm astonished that you're quickly turning to another gospel. He says, it's not that there is another gospel, right? He's, He's using this just by way of demonstrating to them that Even if an angel from heaven were to come above, or Paul puts himself in these shoes and said, even if I came to you teaching you something different from the divine message of salvation by grace through faith, then even I am the one who am deceived. You see, because this gospel is not an invention of our own thinking, but it's from God and God alone. He goes on as he then tries to help these Galatians see where this gospel comes from. And he tells the story of his conversion. You all are familiar with his conversion from Acts chapter nine. While he's walking along the road and Christ reveals himself to him and he, he, he relays this same experience here. And he, in, in Galatians 1.11, he says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to relay the story of how that happened to him. You see, even after he was converted, his first concern, as he tells us here, was not even to go to the apostles, to the pillars of the church, and to then gain their authority in his life. He relays that after he was converted, in verse 17 of chapter one, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But when I saw none of the other apostles except for James, the Lord's brother, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. So his whole framework of ministry is to approach life as though this gospel that he's received is from above. It's an authority that stands over him. The focus is on the message and not the messenger as that which has the power to transform lives. Paul was preaching not some beautiful teaching of human genius that was created, but was preaching something of heavenly origin. And so because this is from heavenly origin, then it's going to, as we trace these four themes, he's going to then produce something in how he approaches other people and how he thinks about truth. It's amazing to see that he so boldly proclaims that people are accursed. If you proclaim another gospel, and if I even come to you and proclaim another gospel than the one I proclaimed, and I mix in that some works are required for your salvation, let him be accursed. There's a very clear line in the sand that Paul draws here on the exclusivity of the gospel. In our day and time, when there are cultural headwinds that push us in the direction of tolerance, that push us in the direction of consensus, that that put us in the waters of going with the flow, Paul obviously viewed the source of the gospel being from God and not from man as the distinguishing factor for the church that then led to an authority in the message, not the man, that then led to a way of life that was courage and strength. And so the reality is that the gospel is revealed as a communication of God and it's not a product of man. This means it stands authoritative over all of us. And in Paul's case, the authority of the gospel revealed from above meant that he had to stand for truth with courage. 
So that brings us to our second point as we look at the, how the crucified life produces courage for truth and life. Second of these themes is that, that Paul's story is that of treasuring truth. In the Galatian churches, the truth under challenge was that righteousness is attained by faith and not by works. The key question to ask is, are we gaining righteousness by faith or by works? Let's look at how he engages this. We go over to Galatians chapter 2. As he is wrapping up this story, he's, he's walking through about and talking about another visit he makes to Jerusalem. So we've got a visit to Jerusalem that we've already read about where right after he's converted, he goes and in, in Acts chapter nine, it tells us they're scared that Paul shows up and Barnabas had to encourage the other disciples that, oh, wait, wait, Paul's one of us now. He's not here to hurt us, right? This is fresh off of his conversion. And we see another visit that he makes. And here he says it's 14 years after his conversion, if you take a lot of modern, modern commentators and how they are associating this. Martin Luther says this is 18 years and he compounds several of the time markers here. Regardless, we're talking somewhere between 14 to 20 years after Paul's conversion. This is not fresh off of his conversion to Christ. He's not new to the church. He is well known. He has planted churches. He has done missionary journeys. And so now here he is in Galatians 2.25, uh, sorry, Galatians chapter two, verse two through five, going back to Jerusalem. He says, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me, and I went up because of a revelation set be and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek, Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. All right, so here's the scenario. Paul going back because of some prompting from the Lord. We don't know exactly what that is. Maybe this was a, a visit he made that's narrated in the book of Acts where he was going to take some money back to the Jerusalem church because there was a famine in Judea and there was a prophet named Agabus who, who went and, uh, and, and told the, the church in Antioch about this. And so maybe that's what it's referring to. But as he goes, he goes and he's, he's not going, as it says, to gain their authority to say, hey, have I been preaching the right gospel, guys? He's going knowing that the unity of the church around the gospel matters. And he's going knowing that Peter, James, and John, as he'll come to refer to them in this passage as the pillars of the church, are the ones that he has to demonstrate unity with for the sake of the health of this church, these churches in the region of Galatia. So he goes and as there are false brothers there, he takes Titus along with him. And the interesting thing about Titus is he's a Greek. And as a Greek, it means Titus is not circumcised. And so as he takes them to the church in Jerusalem, he might be taking Titus along even as a test case to say, look at this brother. He loves Jesus. He's walking with him. He, he is a Gentile who is not circumcised and he is not keeping the law. Jerusalem church, does he have the true gospel? Right? And as they're there, there's false brothers who have slipped in to spy out the freedom that they claim in the gospel, who are appealing and saying, no, 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 for him to be really spiritually right with Jesus, for him to really walk with Jesus, Titus needs to be circumcised. And Paul says that in verse five, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, right? This issue that is not just out there in theology land and in theory, but comes all the way down to be very personal for a man named Titus, right? And what it means to love Jesus and walk with him is something that Paul fleshes out for the Galatians to show them that this deception that snuck in amongst you, it's not the first time this has come up. This came up in the church in Jerusalem. And when it came up there, we didn't yield to it for a moment because how we act is a demonstration of what we believe and that courage to resist and stand firm and correct the false theology of the false brothers ultimately is something that is connected to preserving the gospel. Did you catch that phrase in verse five? To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved 
for you. He goes on in verse nine, he says that when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Acknowledging the unity of the gospel and what it produces, they were then able to band together in ministry. Paul clarifies this issue of truth when you get into chapter two, verse 16. And he's explaining more about this salvation by works and salvation by faith and that it's through faith alone by grace. And he says in chapter two, verse 16, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus. In order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Leon Morris commenting on this passage says, if salvation can come by our own human efforts, then there's no need and no place for the cross. Salvation by Christ's atoning death and salvation by human effort are mutually exclusive. The cross is at the heart of the Christian way and the cross means salvation by grace. Any other than this is not Christian. Or in the words of Paul, we do not yield to this for one moment so that the truth of the gospel will be preserved. Well, this is all well and fine and we see this very clearly as it relates to matters of the gospel and that of course we defend the very heart of the gospel as salvation by grace through faith. What other ways are we facing the cold winds around us that pressure us to depart from the truth of God? Sometimes we need to think about these issues in our life, maybe perhaps related to identity. In our day and time, we will continually be confronted with and seek to and and press to provide an answer to the world around us about issues like sex and gender, ethnicity and race, and politics that are very different from a biblical worldview than the way the world is approaching them. Issues of human dignity relating to the beginning of life and abortion. The quality of life and and, and how we respect people who are disabled or have special needs, the end of life and how the elderly are treated are all ways in which the, the, the cold winds of culture are beginning to blow and press us in ways that don't honor God. By the way, all of these things are rooted in Genesis 1 and 2, where the most offensive thing we believe as Christians is in the beginning God. And everything else, in a sense, is a footnote to the first few words of the Bible. And so when it comes to human origins, and we are then saying, no, there is absolute human dignity, regardless of class or status or race or ethnicity, because in the beginning God created, and he created humanity in his image, and we root it there, will be ostracized and attacked at that point. There's no surprise that that's happening. When we say that the impact of the fall in our lives might be real, but ultimately our identity is in Christ and not in our sexuality or our gender or in our political alliances or anything like that. That's because in the beginning, God, it could cost us. It could cost us along the way in our educational paths of seeking graduate schools. It could cost us in our professions. Uh, if, if not something serious, at, at least at a minimum, being in an intellectual and spiritual minority in those settings. And these are things we need to embrace, not as holy curmudgeons, but as joy-filled servants of God who recognize that the truths that we claim are truths that are built on a gospel that's from above and not below, and that these are truths that are produced from the mind of God and not from the mind of man. And so just as Paul stood courageous for righteousness by faith and not by works, we'll stand courageously for that one and there's a whole other list of things where we'll find ourselves in whatever age we live, this is not unique to 2018, that we need to stand distinct for the truth of God. So the progression of Paul's story has led us from reckoning with the gospel as divine revelation rather than the invention of humanity We've seen that as a result of this divine revelation, truth is not something that's accommodated to human preference, but it's communicated from God 
And it's a reality to which we conform. And so with this, we turn to the third theme in Paul's storyline here of crucified courage. The crucified life produces courage for truth and life. And this third theme is that Paul's story raises the question of our response to the revealed gospel. Will we live according to the fear of God or according to the fear of man? Look with me in chapter one, verses nine and 10. He's disturbed, he's astonished that they've departed from the gospel. They've bought into this false teaching and he says in verse nine, as we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. This demonstrates itself in how he even relates to the apostles when he goes to Jerusalem on that second trip I described for you. So you go to chapter two, verse 16. He says, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus in order to be justified by faith and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And he builds his ministry off of this in such a way that when he goes to Jerusalem, in chapter two, verse five, he says, that as he goes and he talks to those who are influential, he says, and those from whom seem to be influential, what they are makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I say who seemed influential added nothing to me. Right? He's talking about Peter, James, and John here. He's talking about the people he went to partner with, to forge a unity in gospel ministry. And now here he is saying, you know, they seem to be influential, but that means nothing to me. It might look like Paul's just kind of turning an indifferent shoulder to his brothers in Christ here in the ministry. I don't think that's what he's doing. What he's doing is what he's acknowledging that, yes, these are the pillars of the church. He acknowledged respect towards them as the apostles and the pillars. But at the same time, he's saying the ultimate authority doesn't lie with them. The authority lies with the fact that we bear the same gospel, which means we steward the same truth communicated from God and his words, which means it bears the same implication for all of our lives that while they are amazing leaders for the gospel, they're still men. And we align as much as we align in the message. This stroke of courage for Paul was not uh, just a matter of indifference. It was not just a personality trait, as we'll come to see when he confronts Peter here in a moment. He's a master of understatement. You know, in verse 10, he asks, am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Who am I really living for here, people? What do you think? Am I trying to please God or trying to please man? He says, you know, if I were trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ because those two things don't work together because he's supreme in my life. Well, the fact that he's asking that rhetorical question is almost humorous considering in the two verses prior, he declared people anathema. He said, if you preach another gospel, if I were to come to you and preach another gospel, if an angel from heaven were even to come preach another gospel, it's a deception from the enemy and let him be accursed. He's obviously not living for the approval of people if he's proclaiming them accursed. He's asking these rhetorical questions then, not by way of uh, trying to, to persuade, but by way of showing that ultimately Jesus has authority over all. Distinctions that seem very important in this earth's societies have no relevance in God's dealings. Distinctions that matter so much to many of us here on earth, when they're viewed from the eyes of an omnipotent God, all of a sudden, hold no difference. I think of some moments in my own life where living according to the perspective and fear of other people versus the perspective and fear of God have sometimes gone well and sometimes haven't. Uh, I went to a state university for my undergraduate degree, which was the essence at some points of a secular education and at some points, the essence of a secular indoctr indoctrination. And in my degree program, I took a class called History of Early Christianity with a professor who on syllabus day 
was started walking through the syllabus. We went through the books we were gonna read. And as he's describing the class, he says, just so you guys know, I don't think a word of the Bible is legitimate. I don't think it's historically reliable. I don't think it's the word of God. And I don't wanna hear from a single one of your parents because one time I had a parent call me and accuse me of being the antichrist for tearing down her son's evangelical faith in the university classroom. He said... So, of course, as we're going through this course, I learned a great deal. And of course, the winds of the culture were blowing in this course, contrary to just about everything that the Bible teaches. I would come to learn later through more study and uh, getting serious about these things that even a lot of the things were intellectually dishonest or not accurate uh, that were operating there. But in those moments, there were times where I still can remember the moments of conviction where the spirit of God was saying to me, stand up and say something about that. Correct that. Get in the books and study that deeper so then you can come back. Go find somebody who can help you. And what did I do? Sometimes I sat silent, right? Why? Fear of God versus fear of man. Fear of man one. At another class, it was a world religions class and you know, we come to the debate about all the different world religions out there and how do they all operate together, taught again by a very secularist-minded professor. And again, the winds in the class were blowing all towards the truth that, or towards the idea that uh, ultimately there's no one single truth. And I remember a guy in the class, I was taking the class with another friend, there came a moment where talking about the exclusivity of the claims of Christianity and how could anybody believe that? And there wasn't a single person in the classroom as this discussion started who really thought that somebody would actually hold to that. These Neanderthals are somewhere out there, but surely they wouldn't be in an educated place like a university classroom was essentially the comment that was made. And so me and my friend in a moment kind of nudged each other and said, well, actually, we're right here, right? And a great, colorful debate began in which the exclusivity of the gospel became clear to some classmates and a professor. And so, as we come up against these matters of the truth that we steward and the implications it bears from our lives about some of these things I've already mentioned about our identities individually or as a society and about dignity for humanity and about origins, these are all moments where we're gonna be pressed to defend the faith in courage. So there's one more theme that we see in Paul. In every facet of life, we'll be faced with moments where we have to choose. And as we choose, we have the opportunity to either demonstrate righteous leadership or hypocrisy. One of the most fascinating sections of the New Testament is when Paul confronts Peter over this very thing. Pick up with me in Galatians 2, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And when the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Of all the people, of all the people in the leadership of the church, Peter, bowing to the fear of man over the fear of God, that this church in Antioch where there are Gentile believers came and uh, he is dining with them in liberty, not, apparently not keeping the, the Jewish dietary law and the requirement of that, showing the liberty that the gospel brings, that his righteousness is not attained by the keeping of the law until some other people come from Jerusalem. And then all of, su- of a sudden, the winds change. And what does he do? He draws back. You can imagine Peter saying, Paul, what, I mean, what, do you, what did I do wrong here? All I did was I was eating with him, now I'm not. And so in what way did he compel hypocrisy? Words speak, or actions speak louder than words, do they not? And so by his actions, he was demonstrating that ultimately you want to be right with God, you want to be in the spiritual in crowd, you've got to keep the law. And it's a, what's amazing about this is that even Barnabas was led astray into hypocrisy. Barnabas, the one who defended Paul 
early in his conversion. Barnabas, who was the son of encouragement. Barnabas, who was on mission for God, even as a result of Peter's leadership, found himself in hypocrisy. And so we have the opportunity here to see that ultimately we can either lead with righteous leadership or hypocrisy. If there was anybody who was wired by way of personality to stand boldly for the faith and demonstrate courage, wasn't it Peter? Yet, who is the one falling into sin here? Peter. Who is the one who is confronting Paul? And so this raises the issue for us that we need to then think about how to live with courage and strength and boldness, acknowledging that we can all fall and that there's a restoration for those who fall. How do you think Peter fell? Uh, how do you think Peter felt after this fall? How do you think Barnabas felt after this fall? Paul had sharp words. He confronted them publicly. But then we come to Galatians 6, chapter 1, where Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. All right? The purpose of confrontation here is restoration. And that's what God does. And so... The crucified life produces courage for truth and how we live. We speak of ordinary people becoming extraordinary heroes. I reference United Airlines Flight 93. One of the individuals on that flight, he's become pretty well known as a name guy, guy by the name of Todd Beamer, who was flying on a business trip that day. Here's what his wife Lisa said to, about him. Todd was an ordinary guy. He was extraordinary to me and to his family, but to the world, he was ordinary. And like any ordinary guy sitting on a plane that day in a business suit, he was able to do extraordinary things. And so the anchor of all this is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The work that God has done in our lives then prepares us all to stand courageous in faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll sing out chapel. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder that you are working in us to transform us and as you transform us, we will look less like the world around us and we will look more like Christ and that will mean that sometimes we will not fit in. And Lord, as we don't fit in, may we stand with a holy joy that makes the gospel attractive. Lord, may we also stand with a holy courage that leads people to righteousness and protects from hypocrisy. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.